Richard, I was trained in neuroscience. I've enjoyed studying philosophy. And many neuroscientists, the vast majority, think that whatever the mind is, many problems to be solved, it will ultimately be entirely explained by the brain. Some philosophers believe that literally there's an identity, that brain states are mind states. How do you begin to approach this critical problem of what it, human beings are all about? A full description of what's going on in the world can't just include uh, what's going on in your brain and not mention whether you are in pain, whether you are thinking about philosophy, uh, whether you are trying to move your hand or whatever. Um, it's got to describe the content of your mental life. So let me just uh, bring out this point by defining a few terms. These are my definitions, but they enable us to cut up what there is in the world in a useful way. Let's call something a physical event if uh, anyone can know about it as well as anyone else can. And let's call something a mental event if uh, the person to whom it occurs uh, is in a bet necessarily in a better position to know that it's occurring than anyone else. So, for example, this chair being here is something that I can find out about and you can find out about and anyone can find out about and nobody is better privileged to find out about it than anybody else. Uh, but whether I am having a pain or not is something that I am in a better position to discover than you. Of course, uh, you can make a reasonable inference from my behavior. If I'm holding my jaw or screaming, it's not unreasonable to suppose I'm in pain. And it may well be when you find out a lot more about my brain, that will also give you a lot of information about this matter. But nevertheless, I know about it because I'm experiencing it. And whatever way you have of finding out about it, I can also find about it. If you find out about it from my behavior, I could watch a film of my behavior and reach whatever conclusion you reach. And um, if you learn about it from my brain, I could uh, learn about what's going on in my brain and find out about it. But I have a way of finding out about it that you don't, and I shall therefore always be ahead of you. I have privileged access. So a mental event, let's call it, uh, is something to which the subject has privileged access. Now, there's two sorts of mental events. There's pure mental events and impure mental events. Uh, an impure mental event is one which has a physical event as a part. For example, uh, me watching you or me seeing you, this is a mental event because I can know better whether I'm seeing you uh, than you can. But on the other hand, I can only see you if you're there. So... Uh, <laughs> me seeing you entails that uh, you are sitting there. And that's something uh, that everybody can have access to. So let's call a pure mental event one which doesn't include a physical event as a part. All cases of perception are, are impure events because you only perceive something if it's there and that's a physical thing, whereas you're the fact that you have access to it, that's a, that's a mental thing. Okay, well, a pure mental event is something that doesn't entail, that is to say, the description of it is compatible with anything happening in the physical world. Now, whether I'm in pain or not is a pure mental event. It doesn't entail, that's to say, it's not part of what you mean by saying that I'm in pain, that something's going on in my brain. Uh, it couldn't be because it was a discovery of, of uh, neuroscience that something happens in my brain when I'm in pain. But they couldn't even, there wouldn't have been any need to discover this if it was already part of the meaning of saying I was in pain. So uh, clearly, uh, being in pain doesn't entail anything going on uh, in the brain or anywhere else in the physical world. And uh, once you've got this definition of pure mental events, it becomes clear that there's rather a lot of pure mental events. There are sensations, um, obviously pains and uh, uh, pleasure sensations and so on, but all the richness of color and uh, sound that we are aware of, so color in our visual field, patterns of color in our visual field, patterns of sound, uh, which may or may not come from the outside world, and so on and so forth. And then as well as the, the sensory element, there are current thoughts, 
things cross my mind. It's Saturday today. Uh, I have better access to what's crossing my mind in that sense than you do. Um, and there's my beliefs, uh, and there's my intentions, that's to say what I'm trying to do. Sometimes philosophers and scientists say that, well, we know what people's beliefs are from the way they behave, and we know what their intentions are from the way they behave. Uh, but um, the way we behave uh, depends on a conjunction of uh, beliefs and intentions, and the same behavior can ex be explained by very different conjunctions of behavior of beliefs and intentions. For example, suppose I have a headache, I say, give me a pill, and you give me uh, I'm asking for an aspirin, uh, but you give me a, a pill which is in fact cyanide and I die. Now, there's two possible explanations of your behavior. One, you believed it was an aspirin and you were trying to cure my headache. Alternatively, uh, you believed it's cyanide and you were trying to kill me. The same behavior would be explained by uh, <laughs> different combinations of belief and intention. And you know best which is the true one. Of course, once again, there's reasonable inferences other people can make, uh, but that's not the same. Uh, you have privileged access to what your intentions are, what your beliefs are, and they're not fully shown in what you do, as my example illustrates. And finally, you know your desires, you know what you, you, you want and uh, try to get, and, um, and feel inclined to get, and so on. So there's this rich mental, pure mental life of sensations, thoughts, beliefs, intentions, and desires. And a full description of the world has got to include these. And since the occurrence of physical things doesn't entail the occurrence of these things, they are further features of the world. And any science which ignores this is just um, uh, putting its head in the sand. It's not, not facing up to, to, to the realities of life. Many philosophers claim that consciousness is an illusion, and therefore the distinctions that you're making between the mental and the physical states are really um, uh, non-existent because the mental states are really illusory uh, results of what happens when different brain states compete with each other in giving us afferent information. And the result of that we think is a mental state which really doesn't exist. An illusion of an illusion is also an illusion, is also a mental state. <laughs> that is to say, by my criteria, if you are having an illusion, this is something you are better acquainted <laughs> with than people who uh, study your behavior from outside, and you know better whether anything's going on and what's going on. The only way any philosopher and scientist can put forward such a theory is in the belief that he is having such illusions and he is in a better position than anyone else to know about it. I'm afraid there is no escape from the fact that there is an enormous rich life of consciousness which may be causally connected with the brain. I don't wish to deny that, but it's a different thing. If neuroscience ignores that, well, neuroscience is just carving up a territory it can deal with and refusing to deal with uh, what it uh, uh, finds too difficult.